Are eyebrows considered facial hair? I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil is so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, this past Easter, back in April, what we did is we, we had the largest survey we ever did. We handed out over, uh, over 700 people had the opportunity to participate on Easter Sunday in a survey. When we ask you and our guests, what are the topics that are most prominent on your list of knowing about? So we gave you an opportunity to fill that out. And also with some, some blanks you could fill in as well. Do you know the number one, the series is all about answering the questions you asked for. Thus, you asked for it. The number one question that won by a wide margin was this following. How do I handle stress? How do I handle stress? The number one answer, and uh, that was it. And so today we're going to deal with how do we handle stress? And some of you are getting stressed out, the fact that I'm talking about stress. <laughs> How do we deal with stress? Number one answer uh, that people want to know about. And next week, we'll talk about this. What's my purpose? That was the second one. Is what's my purpose? Why am I alive? Am I here just to pay the bills, send the kids off, or try to get married or not get married, and then go to Florida, sit on the porch, rock back and forth, go to a nursing home and die? Is there more life than just that? And that was the number two question you all asked. And the third one was, how do I change? So I'm excited. We're going to be doing a six-week series uh, through this process, hitting the questions that you wanted to know about. Thus, you asked for it today. How do I deal with stress? According to the Psychological Association, in 2015, guess what the top point of stress point for people in the United States is? Number one by, again, another wide, wide margin. Number one, top stress for American citizens and people that live in America. And guess what it is? You guys are good. Did you do the survey? Absolutely. See, it's, it's almost intuitive. Money. Money is the number one stress point in people's lives. People are stressed out. I mean, you can see the market going up and down like a roller coaster at Six Flags, right? I mean, all the stuff taking place, bills that have to be paid, uh, bills, and so many bills, you got to take pills to, to deal with the bills. I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? So money is a big issue. And I want to say something about money for a moment, and it's this. This is a little... This is a little caveat, a little bit of an advertisement. We're going to have us, uh, one of the series is, how do we live during the last days? And I can tell you, the Bible says that the number of the beast, you cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. It talks about economic system. So make no mistake, that anxiety about money, if the enemy can get that, he can, he can take us around and control us. So that's why it's important. We remember, everything comes from God. So that's the number one thing. Number one thing. And do you realize that we are overworked we're distracted and we are tired. I read that through a survey this past couple of weeks and research for this, that you and I are gonna work 181 more hours a year than our parents did. 181 more hours, that's an extra month of work we're having. We're working more now than we had in the history, in modern history. And also, uh, it says that a lot of women Housewives and house dads, 80% of mothers feel overstressed and sleep deprived. Can I hear an amen on that? All right. That's not very good. You should say, no, Lord. Okay. But 80% of mothers feel overstressed and sleep provide. And, and so much to do and so little time to do it. There's an old Beatles song, eight days a week. You know, I, I mean, I feel that some way sometimes too. Can you meet with me this week? Well, gee, I, no, I can't. But if there was another day of the week, we could. A lot of us are overwhelmed by our schedules. We're overwhelmed by all the things that we have to do and we're stressed out and we're trying to get de-stressed. And the more you try to get de-stressed, the more stress you feel. 
And it just goes on and on and on. I like what Job, I was reading through the Bible in a year, we're doing that as a congregation, and there's a verse in Job 9.25, it says in New Century Version, then I'll give you a new living translation. It says this, my days go by faster than a runner. They fly away without my seeing any joy. Or uh, my life passes more swiftly than a runner. It flees away without a glimpse of happiness. Have you ever found that? You get up in the morning, you get ready for work, and wait a minute, I'm going back to bed. What happened to my day? Has it ever happened to you where the day just flies by? There just does not seem to be enough hours and seconds in the day to accomplish what we're called to accomplish. Well, we're going to talk about several ways, three basic ways we can deal with stress today. And I, I'm going to tell you, I get real frustrated growing up, going to church uh, and, and hearing about all these things I should be doing. You got to do this, you got to do that and the other. This will not be another guilt wrap. What we're going to do is look at some areas and what are some solutions for us to de-stress our lives. How many of you like to de-stress your life a little bit? I know I would. So then what's the first way of handling with stress? And number one is this, you and I need to connect to God. Oh, that's, that's really brilliant. We have to connect with God. How obvious is that? It may be obvious, but the question is, are we really connecting with God on a daily basis? We know it's the thing we're supposed to do, right? See, this is an opportunity. This is not a guilt trip where you need, you need to read your Bible. You need to love God. You need to do this. And all these, like, you ever hear that? You need to love the Lord God with all your heart and your mind, your soul, and your strength. This is not a, a, a task. This is an opportunity. And so what we're calling to do, I don't know if you realize this, you and I, you hear me say it all the time, you were designed by God for God. Your, your basic DNA, the way you were designed, was to have communion with God. When that was broken through sin, something went off, okay? And when we start connecting with God, we start connecting with our own purposes and our own desires, it's off, it's off, skilt, it's off tilt. And as a result, our trajectory is wrong, and we end up hurting ourselves and other people because we're designed by God for God. And until we give our life to God on an ongoing basis, we're going to hurt ourselves and other people. We are designed by God for God. I hope you understand that. And so if you're not connecting with God on a daily basis or on a continued basis, you're going to find yourself stressed out because you're going to start taking on yourself things that you shouldn't be taking on. Jesus says, cast all your cares upon, Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. The Bible also says, Jesus says, come to me, those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will will give you rest for your soul. You see, realize that there's no, there's a test to find the rest. And that test is beginning to connect with God. Now, how does that work? Well, I don't know if you realize this, from the very beginning of mankind, before sin entered the planet, mankind was made perfect and had a communion with God on an ongoing basis. Sin disrupted it and set things the wrong way. Now, what's very interesting is this. I want to open your Genesis. It's right here on the screen. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 says this, and this is the very beginning. It's always good to go back and look at what was the original intent of our designer, of our creator, of our father. What was his original intent? And this is what it was. So, the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was a day where he rested from all of creation. Now, does God really need to take a rest? No. Did Jesus need to be baptized? No. Why did he do it? He leads by example. You and I were created for rest. Now, this is very significant. Do you realize a Sabbath rest was instituted prior to sin entering humanity? Let me say that again. I don't think you got it. <laughs> Do you realize that a Sabbath rest was instituted in our schedule of how we were designed prior to the fall of mankind? Before sin came, we were designed to have a rest with God. We would stop from our normal activity and to refocus and re-synergize, whatever you want to call it, and, and calibrate ourselves to our Heavenly Father to have a day away from our normal toil and spend it with God. This was given to us prior to the fall of man. Now, if that be the case, if it was important for us to have a day of rest, a Sabbath rest prior to sin, how much more important is it to have it now that we have to contend with a sin problem that we have to face? It's actually in the very formation of a human person. 
The way God designed us, we need to have a rest, a Sabbath rest. And the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 9, which we'll get to a little bit later on as well, says this. So there's a special rest still waiting for the people of God. Do you realize that God wants us to be at rest? He doesn't want to see you arrested. He wants to see you at rest. God has created us to be at rest. God has created us to have fellowship with him. Peter says, I quoted it earlier, I'll quote it again, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. We're not called to be a beast of burden carrying all these burdens upon our back. But we do, don't we? And part of the reason is we don't know how to take a rest. I just want to encourage you to do this. This is something that God has instituted to take a Sabbath. I can't afford it. I can't afford to take a Sabbath. I'm too busy. If you're too busy, there's something wrong. If you can't take a rest, Joe Lieberman, who ran for vice president of America, who was a former um, senator of Connecticut, when he was running with Al Gore back in 2000, he wrote a book called About the Sabbath. And he said while he was on the campaign trail, and my friends, I don't care what your political affiliation is, being on the campaign trail is grueling to your schedule. And he managed to keep his Sabbath during this campaign schedule. And he talks about the benefits of it. He goes in his whole, it's a great book, by the way. He talks about the medical benefits, the psychological benefits. He does some research on it. And it's really true that he took a day to stop. You know, there's two men cutting, cutting wood. And one guy keeps leaving all the time and keeps coming back. And the other guy's like, why do you keep leaving for 20, 30 minutes at a time? He says, because I'm sharpening my ax. When you trust God and say, I'm going to take a day of rest, you are sharpening the axe of your, your psyche, of your spiritual man, that you can cut more. Trace um, Truett, the founder of Chick-fil-A, that restaurant has a Sabbath. They do not work on Sundays. And do you know the profits of that fast food restaurant chain have been one of the top in the country? And they produce more revenue in six days than other restaurants do in seven. McDonald's has been declining. Chick-fil-A has been increasing. They honor God with the schedule. You see, and God has created us for rest. This is before the, the fall of man. And so it's important that you take a rest. And we'll talk about how to do that in a few moments. How, how can we cut our schedule? How can we get rid of some stuff that just we're constantly on task to do things? The Bible says in Psalm 90:12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. My friends, we all have the same amount of time on each day, 365 days. How do we handle our time? You know how we spend our time? They're very interesting. I did a little, uh, little surveys and saw. Do you know that out of a normal, they say out of 70 years being on the planet, just say you live 70, which is very, very extraordinary young, isn't it? It should be a lot older than that, but just for the survey. If you're 70, you're a teenager. Okay. You spend 25 years of your life sleeping. And it better not be in church. <laughs> you work from age 20 to 65. You will work 10.3 years straight. You're going to work for 10.3 years. And this is what I heard also. Women spend 17 years of their life Trying to lose weight. <laughs> Guys don't care. It's obvious, right? <laughs> and you watch 9.1 years of television or cable, or whatever. And you know you spend two years watching commercials. That's why I got. That's why I had the hard drive. I, don't, I refuse to watch commercials. Do you realize in an average football game? A three-hour NFL football game, there's only 11 minutes of actual play on the field. God help you, folks. Okay. And you spend 1.1 years just cleaning alone. For some of you, you spend about 20 minutes of your whole life. But anyhow, you drive a car for 4.3 years in your lifetime. That is enough time to drive there and back to the moon three times. And finally, you spend a year and a half in the bathroom. <laughs> the average person goes six times a day. And some of you have been to your houses. You have libraries in your bathroom. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about here. I'm not going to point any fingers. Oh, sorry. 
I had been in a house where they had libraries. It was phenomenal. Like, wow, there are all these great books. And this is another one. This is really shocking. This is shocking. You and I spend, if you're a modern American, you spend 70% of your waking life in front of digital media. Let me say that again. <laughs> this is digital media. You spend 70% of your waking life in front of digital media. That we spend 11 hours a day in front of our devices. 11 hours a day. In fact, there's some more statistics about this. It's very interesting. 73% of adults now use social networking sites of some kind. The average American on social media platforms receive about 54,000 words and 443 minutes of video each day. More than 1 billion tweets are sent every hour and about 100,000 tweets a minute. 20 million emails were sent from the time it took me to say this one sentence. And this is the one that I find very interesting and very telling and very true. 16 minutes of every hour is spent on social networking sites. 16, the average American that has smartphones and all, 16 minutes of every hour is spent on social networking sites. That every hour, I've got a Facebook, this one. I mean, Instagram. Now they have something called, um, per, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you take shed videos. Periscope. What is that what it called? Periscope. And, and, you know, these are all great things to stay connected. But I, I, I've been there. To, oh, we got to get this on Facebook. Wait a minute. The kids are here. We're in front of the Grand Canyon. And we're worrying about a selfie to put on Facebook. Why not enjoy the Grand Canyon? Right? And so we're always on our devices. It's like, what would happen if we went to God as much as we went to our smartphones? I, I don't know what would happen. You think maybe revival would happen? The country would change? We could change the world? I think maybe that could be the case. There is a new syndrome, a new disease to worry about. It's called IFS, <laughs> Information Fatigue Syndrome. We are so distracted as a nation, we are producing ADD in people that never have it. We're training people that can't stay on task. A goldfish, I read in one article, has a longer attention span than we do. I mean, how many times are you sitting there talking to somebody? Mm -hmm. zz, 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 zz. Yeah, I'm doing great. I mean, how many times we have a little buzzing going in our pocket? My grandparents, if they could come back, they'd say, what's your problem? What's all that buzzing? Zz, 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 zz. Right? Think about it. We're in the middle of something, and we're constantly looking at our phones. God forbid we miss a text. You know, we need to find out what's going on. I mean, I, even I, I've been, I've been guilty of it too. I'm sitting there looking here. I'm looking at little John, John Joe from third grade. I haven't talked to him in 30 years, and I just saw he bought a brand new car. And I'm looking at it, looking at his family. Why do I waste my time looking at John Joe? Some of you got your own John Joes and your Jane Doe's, right? And you're sitting there looking at people you intend never to talk to, but you have all these friends on Facebook, but you have no friends in real life because we're too busy Facebooking. Listen, Facebook's a wonderful tool, but man, think about it. Every hour, it's not hard to believe, is it? 16 minutes of every hour. Corporations and companies. My brother works for a company, and they started monitoring all their cell phone. Every he had to get another cell phone because they were looking at everything he did. He had to stop doing fantasy sports. No, I'm just kidding. But many people waste company time Facebooking, Instagramming, and why not enjoy the moment? He go, wait, 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 let me stop. And we're always on these blasted devices. What would happen if we just took a digital Sabbath? Once on the same. I, I, I know, I use this. I'm talking about turn off the network, and just, I use it to read books, and I use it to study. But I'm talking about get off the network. Get off the, get off the grid. Get off the grid. And I'm going to have a day where I'm turning off the grid and I'm just going to, I'm just going to honor God and honor my family and I'm not going to do any work, no digital media. What would happen? I think we'd have a way to relax. When I grew up, there was something called Blue Laws. Remember those? And, and, the, and on Sunday, the streets were empty. The stores were closed. There was a I used to hate it as a kid because I wanted to go out and play. But we used to all get together at my grandma's house and have a pot roast. 
and we'd sit there and eat meals together. Everyone would get together. We'd have a family meal, and then we'd play uh, Monopoly or something like that, or we'd go out and just enjoy ourselves. We'd go to church. It was a wonderful day of relaxation. The madness stops now. It's 24, 365. It never stops. It never stops. And we constantly hear this anxiety is on us, always have to perform, always got something on our mind no matter where we go. I mean, in the old days, I'd drive a car, and I had no idea if you called me or not. And I'd have to wait until I got back home or to the office and I had to play a tape. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like a little plastic thing that has like this little tape on it and it records things on it. And you'd hit, leave a message after the beat. And then, and then you were so proud of the fact that you're the answer machine. You go through a long explanation. When you hear the beep, leave your name. That's right. I have one from Radio Shack. And you talk about, remember those days? And you'd actually had to go to a pay phone. And then the 90s came. It was cool to have a beeper. I had a beeper. It was, I felt, Bzz. what's that? It's my beeper, you know? And I remember, remember the days where in the early 90s when people started getting cell phones? Remember those big, huge, mongous, like footballs? You take a football pack to your head. I remember going to a restaurant and there'd be some, some, some pompous person on the phone. Yeah, so I trade my stocks. He's sitting there talking. I said, how arrogant. Remember this? How, how can a person go to a restaurant and speak on a cell phone? They think they're so important. Remember those guys? Am I the only one? Now it's commonplace. I mean, we're just totally a slave to these things, aren't we? Think about it. Always looking on these things. Always with, at the bedside, in the bed. Some of us don't even talk to our spouse. What are you doing? I'm Facebooking. So this is what happens over and over and over and over and over. 16 minutes. So the first thing is this. We need to connect to God. We need to connect to God more than we connect to our devices, folks. We need to connect to God because you're designed by God. Take a Sabbath. Take a rest. Take a day that's for God. And then connect to God. The second thing is connect to a sustainable schedule. Some of you guys have your schedule so tight it's like a military snare drum. I mean, there's no room for anything else. Everything is tight. One of the things I learned from Dr. Owen Weston in the seminary, he says this. He says, schedule your day and then throw three hours in there of unexpected. You know, it's been good advice. I wish I'd take it and do it. But just expect the unexpected. We are so have unsustainable schedules. Some of you say, I can't do it. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. What's going on? I'm too busy. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a life that's so busy that I can't enjoy life that God has given us. We're so busy. How about Mary and Martha? You know the story, Mary and Martha? And if you don't know the story, there was a situation. Jesus has good friends, Lazarus, Mary and Martha. He's at the house. And there's Martha just cooking up a storm, being busy. And there's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, just enjoying his company while Martha's worried about how the company's going to be. And then Martha gets ticked off. Would you tell my lazy, good for nothing, I'm, I'm putting my own thing in there, get up and give me some help, Jesus. Do you not care that I'm working hard? And Jesus goes, hey, Martha, 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 you have many concerns, but Mary, has, listen, 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 Mary has chosen the better that will not be taken from her. When you spend time with God, you step out of time and enter into eternity. You enjoy God in real time, the clock, the sun, the planets orbiting, all that will be based on time on, light. You step out of the confines of light and enter into the realm of eternity when you spend time with God. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's like all of a sudden, it's like, wow, I'm connected to God. It, it just like every concern goes away. It's like, boom, I'm in the moment. I'm with God. And every time you're with God, you're both now and forever. You take with you everything you do for God, everything you spend time with God with. You're designed for that. Connect to that. And, you know, the reason why we have so much stress is because the quest for things. You and I want things. It's called materialism. Think about it. I mean, we got to, we, for crying out loud, they just released a new iPhone. It's got 3D touch. I got to get that 3D touch. I'm going to sleep overnight. I'm going to get a tent. I'm going to wait in line to buy the latest device. I'm not. I'm just, 
But imagine, you know, think about that. We always, we got so much stress in our lives and we have to get it there all the time. But think about this. The average American, this is scary. The average American spends 120%, sorry, 121% more than they make a year. That's not sustainable. Well, let's break it down to a little bit more easy numbers. Let's say you make, uh, let's just make it uh, even. Let's say you make 50 grand a year as a household. And let, or make whatever you make, $50,000 a year. And let's say your bills are 75. Your lifestyle requires $75,000 and you're only making 50. Would you not think that might create a problem? Absolutely. What are you going to do? Put it on a credit, put it on a credit card. Put it on. That's what our nation does, folks. It's not sustainable. You can't spend money like that, and eventually there's going to come a call to pay the bills. And what happens? The Bible says the borrower is a slave to the lender. And so you got this whip. I got to get that latest bicycle or car. I got to get that latest device. I, I got to move in a bigger and better house. My neighbor just got an in-ground pool and I have an above-ground pool. I got to get the in-ground pool, right? I'm driving a car and it has almost 40,000 miles. It's time for a new car. And, and there's nothing wrong with buying things, but if you can't afford it, don't buy it. My grandparents, once again, I'm honoring them today because they wouldn't spend it unless they had it. Now, it's okay to take loans out to start a new company. I, under, I get that. But when, you, when debt is the way to go, it, my friends, it puts you and I. But why do you think the number one stress in our country is money? Because we are living to try to have money to do things. You don't need the latest and the greatest. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. Well, it's not fair. Everyone else is going to Disney World. Well, if you can't afford to go to Disney World, don't go to Disney World. But um, your kids are going to survive. Believe me, you don't want to wait in lines. <laughs> Go to Six Flags, a lot more lines there. So this is a part that creates stress. And so how do we get free of financial stress? Well, number one, this is very true, and this is honest, and those that do this, you know what I'm talking, this is true. We believe, the Bible says in Malachi, bring your tithe and your offerings to the Lord. When we live, we, we tithe. Everything my wife and I, the first thing out of our check, we tithe immediately, 10%. Tithing is one way. And the second way is to spend, listen to this, this is really, this is revolutionary. <laughs> spend less money than you take in. Now that's like, yeah. Let me say it again. Spend less, if it costs you $2,000 a month to live, don't and you only make two thousand, or you only make fifteen hundred. It'd be a good idea to find a way to cut your expenses, or go back to work, and maybe work at fourteen hundred dollars a month. There's a little margin. What happens if the dishwasher breaks? What happens if your fuel pump goes in your car? You see, we're living by margin. Now listen, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, folks. I understand. It's very, very easy. It's very, very, very easy to get to start spending more than you are able to, to do. It's in our culture, it's on our TV commercials, it's in our movies, it's in our friends. It's in the, wherever you go, people are spending more than they can take in. And we just, we bought the lie and it causes so much stress. I've been to foreign countries where I've been in the mountains and there's poverty, they have nothing. They have dirt floors and grass roofs and the people are happy. My friends, when you and I let money control us, it's not a good thing. Some of you, need to get some plastic surgery. You're not looking too good today. You need plastic surgery. Let me explain. Plastic surgery, some of you need to get your credit cards, you need to get some scissors, you need to cut that sucker up and throw it, throw it away and start paying your bills. No more credit cards. You might get to that stage, cut the darn things up. You're gonna look a lot better next Sunday. You'll be like this, I got, I got plastic surgery. No more wrinkles. Okay, so we need to do that. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, he says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. God promises to what? Promises to give what we need, not what we greed. Life is not measured on how much you own, but yet is that not the case in our culture today? Philippians 3, 7 through 8, this is what the apostle Paul says. And I think we all need to realize this. I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless 
when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I had discarded everything else, counting it all garbage, so I could gain Christ. You know, some of us, we are putting things beyond God. If you're not trusting God with your finances, guess who is your God? This has nothing to do with raising money for the church. Absolutely nothing to do with that. It has everything to do is who's your God. Is the dollar, is money your God, or is God? Are you going to trust God? Tithe and, and, and budget. Reprioritize your life. You ever heard? I remember a number of years ago, get ready with, I'll tell you one. Uh, there was an illustration I did a couple of years ago, and it's very famous, where you take all these rocks and you try to fit them into a bucket, right? And, and so if you start putting sand, little, little rocks in, and the next thing you know, you, you try to get the big rocks in, you can't get them in. And so what the thing is you got to do is take the big rocks, put them in first, and then the little rocks fit. Can you show that illustration real quick? All right, imagine this. Time at the gym or playing golf or whatever. Social networking. Uh, I got to run here and run there. Oh, that's my family time. Uh, there's uh, time with the kids there. Okay, where's my time for my spouse? Uh, gee, I think I don't have time for that. How about time to go to church? Oh, I don't have time. Kids got games, I got busy, I don't have time for that. I can't fit it in. But look what happens now. Go back and put the big rocks in first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Family first, right? I'm going to involve, help other people. And you start putting yourself in the right way, the same container fits the volume of what it has. Why? Because you blew the big rocks first. Some of us are doing the small stuff first. These little 17-minute interruptions every hour will rob you of what's really important. You and I could go to the gym and work out for an hour if we just put these things away, for not have them every single hour. Maybe it's a time to, to have a schedule. I mean, think about it. Time with your family. I mean, so many times we let everything else rob us. Well, I can't go today. You know, I'm going to go ahead and step on some toes. I hope you don't mind. I'm, that's, what I, that's what I'm here for. Our, we, our, our children like to play sports, okay? And Sunday is baseball at 9.30 in the morning. I said, I'm sorry to the coach. Can't play. He's in church. Now, he'll play afterwards, but we made a decision. That, that's between you and God. But what's really important? You're beginning to teach your children what the big rocks are. What's the big rocks? God wants us to fit it in and by putting priority first. And think about it. If the big rocks are taken care of, your family and your work and all these things that are important are taken care of, who cares about the small stuff? Who cares if you didn't have time to go on Facebook? Imagine not having time to go on Facebook because you did other things that are more important. Imagine you... Uh, started working out. Imagine you started going on a date. Imagine you had children FaceTime with your kids or whatever. Imagine that because you have done the big things first. Connect a sustainable schedule. If you're too busy, something has to change. Do you want credit cards telling you what to do? Hey, listen, if you don't make plans, someone else will make plans for you. Let me say it again. If you don't make plans with your time, someone else always has something for you to do. And there's an anointed word that I've learned, very powerful word. It's an incredible word. It's a two-letter word that begins with N. It's called no. Can you go to out tomorrow? No, I can't. I have something else scheduled. What are you doing? I'm not doing that. I got to spend time with my family. I got to spend time with the Lord. I don't have time for to go. You can't do everything, folks. You can't be in every book club, every bridge club, whatever you guys, I don't know, every golf. There's nothing wrong with doing these things. But if they're taking away the essentials, it's going to hurt you. So just cut out what's not important. And you'll have more time later on. That's the first thing. I mean, first thing is connect to God. Number two, connect to a sustainable schedule. And number three, connect to other believers. That's right. Connect to other believers. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 4.12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. Let me stop it right now. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. If there's no one asking me, how are you doing with your marriage? How are you doing with your money? I can be taken by advantage of and beat up and left at the side of the road not doing very well. But what happens, the Bible says here. It says a person staying alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back, conquer, 
three or even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Why do you think Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, not one by one? Because he understood the law of unity and the law of being in community. Guess what? The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it is a try. It is three working together. If the Godhead works together, who do you think you are? You can do it all by yourself. Even the monks gather together in a monastery. Listen, you're not called to do this thing by yourself. We are created for community. Let me give you an illustration to help us out. It says in Ephesians 4, 16, he makes the whole body. What's the church is called the body of Christ. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. So the whole body is healthy and growing full of love. I hear people say, well, I don't like the church. Tell your spouse, honey, I love you, but I don't like your body. Don't tell your spouse that. But that's what you're telling Jesus. You know, Jesus, I love you, but I don't love your body. Listen, if you're not caught in the body, functioning in the body, yeah, nobody's perfect, neither are you. But we're to work together as, as a believers. Think about this. If you're on a soccer team or a basketball team or a baseball team, let's just look at this for a moment. How do you win a game? You have to be part of a what? You have to be part of a team. I'm a baseball player. Are you? Yeah. I'm a professional. What team are you on? I had no team. I go to the batting cage and I hit it hard. I can throw 90 miles an hour in my sleep. But are you part of a team? No, that's small-mindedness. I'm beyond teams. That's how ridiculous, of course. If you're gonna, be in a, if you're gonna win a game, you gotta be part of a team. Now, granted, let me tell you some things very important about this. If you're gonna be on a football team or a baseball team or a soccer team, you're gonna have to practice the rudiments. If you're on a basketball team, you have to practice what? Dribbling and running. The three-point shots, right? You go to the gymnasium, you work on your muscles, you have a good diet, you do all those things by yourself, so when you get together with the team, you're doing better. But what else happens in football and baseball and all that? In football, what do they do? They get together, they study last week's tapes of what they did, they look at the next team they're gonna face the following week, they study their strengths and weaknesses, they study, they're in a classroom setting. What do we do on Sunday morning? We come together, we sit down, we talk about the plays that are gonna happen during the week, we talk about it, we encourage each other how to make the plays, right? And then you're involved in a small group, you got something going on, you can call somebody up, hey, will you pray for me? I'm going for a job interview today or my spouse had this, or my parents are driving me, whatever, and you can call someone else and say, I can help me with this. So we have preparation on your own. We have getting together in a locker room, discussing what we're gonna, then we go out during the week, and you can call your buddies and friends and say, will you pray with me? And we can start doing stuff together. The beautiful thing about Cornerstone is God's calling us to be a team that we can do more together than we can by ourselves. We can do something that's beyond our own. We can work for something bigger than ourselves because we all work together to help change our neighborhoods, to help change our workplace, to help change the local government, to help change the national government. We can and do it if we would get together and help each other out. We're created to be a body. We do more together. Are you serving a purpose higher than yourself? Now, can you give me that green thing? Oh, I got it up here. Never mind. I got it. I'm going to give you an action call. Okay? Something real simple. We talked about connecting with God. We talked about creating a sustainable schedule. And now we're talking about connecting to what? People. A team. We want to encourage you. We have these little green cards, okay? They're not green cards. Some of you are trying to get green cards. No, this is not the green card you want. Uh, but what this is, this is an opportunity for you to get connected to a small group. Now, am I suggesting if you sign up for a small group, all your problems will go away? No, we're not suggesting that for a moment, but it's a start. It's creating an environment where you can begin to foster relationships which can help you walk the path that God has for you. 
Now, there's uh, many different types of things on financial health, on playing golf. Can you believe that? Archery, I mean, a little kind of stuff. And, and uh, book studies and all sorts of cool stuff is in here. Is it exhaustive? No. What happens if there's nothing on here that fits your schedule? Well, why don't you write something on there and hand it in, and we'll make something up if we have to. We can get two or three people together so you are not alone doing this thing by yourself. Some of you are so busy, and I understand you're at different seasons of your life. I know some folks, what they do, they do a conference call while they're driving back from work or while they're going to work in the morning. They're so busy, they'll have a conference call, and they'll call each other at 7 a.m. while they're at Waterbury traffic on that godforsaken place they have construction there. You're sitting behind the traffic, and you're on your Bluetooth, if you don't have a headset, and you're talking to somebody saying, hey, you're doing, and you're beginning to share concerns and praying for each other. If you're that busy, listen, you got to make time to be connected to the body of Christ. you got to have your own individual practice time. You need to come to the locker room and work out some plays together and go on the field and practice. We, what we did this morning by singing those songs and doing that, that was practicing getting the load off your back. Oh, I'm stressed out. We said, no, give it to God. No other name. No other name. Now, when you get home and you're by yourself, he said, no, no other name. I'm seeking God first in his kingdom, and all these things will be added. Therefore, I have no worries about tomorrow. You practice it together with hundreds of people. Now you're by yourself, and you're training, and you can begin to implement what you learn together in group setting. Folks, we're not called to live this by yourself. Get one of these green cards. Fill it out. As you leave here today, there's a little tent on your left, right-hand side. And there's an opportunity for you to take these cards and sign up for it. Also, you know, invite some folks to come. We have to invite cards. Say, hey, look, they're having a series about you ask for it. Some common questions. Invite somebody. They'll come if you invite them. We want to make a difference in the world. Let me pray for you right now. Then we're going to include a couple of scriptures. Let me pray for you right now. Some of you are so stressed out and your schedule is so tight. Remember, connect to God. Make a sustainable schedule. Connect with other believers. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name right now, I pray. Lord, a lot of us in this room right now are stressed out, even those watching on via video or live stream or later on. Father, we're stressed out. We got so much to do and so little time to do it. Father, we recognize the fact that we've allowed our PDAs our phones and technology to take most of our time. Lord, we want to help us right now, Father. Show us those areas we need to cut out of our schedules. Show us where we need to say no so we can say yes. We realize we can't say, we can't say yes until we first say no. Lord, show us what no is in our schedule today. Lord, show us those areas right now in Jesus' name. And Father, we want to make sure that every day we get before you, even if it's 15 minutes, to calibrate ourselves daily to be in your presence, God and it will keep you throughout the day. Lord, I also pray you'd help us with sustainable schedules. And Lord, I pray that you'd begin to connect strategic relationships that you have designed to help us become the men, the women that you've called us to become. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna conclude with two more verses. I appreciate your patience this morning as we conclude. In Hebrews chapter four, we're going back to the very beginning which we talk about connecting to God. Hebrews 4, verse 1. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. What does that mean? Listen, the rest of God is the peace and the solidarity knowing who you are in Christ. And you know what happens if you die. You'll be with Christ. If you don't have that assurance, there's no rest, because you're always wondering, what's going to happen if I die? What's going to happen when people have great fear? You don't have to walk in fear. Jesus died on the cross for us, took the pain, took the stress, so we could find his rest. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For the good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it, but it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter this rest. Everything we've been talking about, 
listen, if you want self-help, go on television, go on, go, go, you know, Tony, whatever, get some of those books. It's not self-help. This is called God working in your life. And what we're talking about here is this. This is the good news. For only we who believe can enter this rest. Otherwise, you're living in a mirage. You're living drugged up on the world, thinking you're okay and you're not. The only true rest you can have is when you're rested in God, knowing who you are in Him. As for the others, as we continue in verse 3, God said, in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since He made the world. God wants us to enter His rest, the rest of God. Jumping ahead to the last two verses, the last three verses. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them rest, rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there's a special rest waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. If you are in Christ, God has not called you to be stressed. He's called you to be rested. If you are stressed, and you have a medical condition, that's another story. That's not for now. Some people are saying, oh, no, no, we'll get into that. But there is rest for you. And let's pray for that right now. Let's, let's bow our heads right now. Some of you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You've tried it, you come to church, you like church, but you've never completely surrendered. It's always my way. I, I can't give it all to God because if I give it all to God, he's going to ask me to do something that I don't, really don't want to do. I have news for you. Your creator made you and knows what's best for you more than you know. And I guarantee you, if you give your life to Christ, you'll experience the greatest rest you ever had because you'll know where you are now and where you're going. What a great place to be. If you've never done that, some of you right now, you just sense something tugging in your heart. It's, it's, it's something your heart's beating a little faster. I believe God is working on you right now. God wants you to enter his rest. And Jesus took care of the rest on the cross. He paid for all the rest. He paid for your sins. But unless you receive him, believe he is the Lord, and ask him to forgive you of your sins and make him the master of your life, there's no rest. Maybe some of you have done it in the past and you've walked away and you're doing your own thing. With every head bowed, just, just to help you out so I can pray a little better. On the count of three, we're going to ask you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I used to walk with God. I've walked away. Perhaps I've never given my life to Christ, but today I want to enter into his rest of knowing who I am in Christ. Real quick, one, just lift those hands. One, two, three. Real quick, anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else this morning? We could thank you. Anyone else? Great. I see some of you are being honest this morning. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you died on the cross to set us free of sin and death, that we could enter the rest. The rest, the peace that comes in knowing who we are in you now and who we will be forever. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, both known and unknown. I thank you that you paid for my sins. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins that I know of and those I don't know of. And to this day, I say, with the act of my will, I declare that you are God and I am not. You are the commander. You're the boss of my life. You're the father of my life. I submit my mission to your mission and declare that I am no longer my own. I am now yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand if we could as the worship team uh, leads us in a closing song. If you prayed that prayer, please share it with somebody. If you want to talk to me or someone on the prayer team, please make your way up. We're going to have a closing song. As we do that, we encourage you as you leave here today to stop by the booth, sign up, and, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. Okay, let's conclude one song. Thank you. Prayer team, please make your way up. Hands up, hearts open wide as the sky. Lift you high, we lift you high. Hands up, hearts open wide as we cry. Oh, God, we lift you high. Our God, we lift you high. We lift.
bless you. May it keep you. Have a phenomenal week. We'd love to invite you to 201 today. It's going to be in the little house right over there. Uh, Sal's house. We have a special class if you've never been part of that. Otherwise, we dismiss you. If you need prayer, come forward. God bless you. No